Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the summit. My name is Andrew Godwin, and I'll be chairing this session on access to justice for culturally and linguistically diverse parties. Let me begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I'm located. I'm actually currently in Bright in northeastern Victoria, a region that encompasses the Buckland Valley, where the Chinese mi miners dug for gold in the 19th century, and where the notorious Buckland riot occurred in 1857. The traditional owners of the land in this region are the Duthuroa, Tongarong, Weiwuru, Ganarkanai, and Yait Matang peoples, and I'd like to acknowledge them and pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Before I introduce our distinguished panelists, I'd like to mention the issues paper that was launched recently and to which Melina referred in her opening comments. Entitled Culturally and Linguistically Diverse Parties in Australian Courts, Insights from New Zealand, this issues paper outlines the landmark report written by May Chen in New Zealand in 2019 and explores the relevance of its findings and recommendations to Australia. It invites submissions by the end of October this year, and I'd encourage all of you to read the issues paper and to share with us your comments, experience and suggestions. So this session speaks to the themes explored by the issues paper, and we're particularly honoured to have with us this afternoon three distinguished panellists. Let me introduce each of them in turn. Justice Emilios Kiru is a judge of appeal of the Supreme Court of Victoria. He was appointed to that position in July 2014 after serving as a trial judge since May 2008. His honour is the second practising solicitor to be appointed to the Supreme Court of Victoria since it was established in 1852. He is also the first and only Greek-born justice of a superior court in Australia. In October 2013, Justice Kiru had the pleasure of launching the Asian Australian Lawyers Association, an event that I remember well because I was at the uh, launch myself in the Supreme Court Library. His Honour was an inaugural member of the Judicial Council on Cultural Diversity and is currently the patron of the Greek Australian welfare charity, Pronia, and the Victorian patron of the Hellenic Australian Lawyers Association. Justice Helen Wood was appointed to the Supreme Court of Tasmania on 9 November 2009. Prior to that appointment, her honour served as a magistrate and was the first woman appointed to that role in Tasmania. Justice Wood has a long-standing interest in human rights <clears throat> and access to justice. Her honour is a member of the Judicial Council on Cultural Diversity and uh, also a member of the board of the Tasmanian Law Reform Institute. She regularly delivers, delivers seminars to the legal profession and to tribunals on the recommended national standards for working with interpreters in courts and tribunals. Her Honour has developed a module on cultural awareness and working with interpreters for the Tasmanian Legal Practice course, which I understand is the first course of its type in Australia. Our third panellist, Mei Chen, is the co-author, along with me, of the issues paper. May's background details reveal an impressive list of achievements, including the establishment almost 30 years ago of Chen Palmer, New Zealand's first public law firm, specialist public law firm. Other achievements include May's service as the inaugural chair of both New Zealand Global Women and Super Diverse Women, her service on the boards of companies and public institutions, and more recently, May's move to the bar and the launch of the Specialist Chambers Public Law Toolbox Chambers. I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge and thank May for her leadership in this area. Her 2019 report really is a landmark report, a report that's been enthusiastically and universally welcomed by the judiciary and legal profession in New Zealand. 
It was also cited by both the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court of New Zealand in the recent case of Deng and Zheng, in which May appeared for the Law Society of New Zealand, which had been invited by the Supreme Court of New Zealand to make a submission as intervener. So the session will commence with a keynote presentation by Justice Kiru. That will run for about 15 minutes. Following uh, that, uh, we'll have a panel discussion with the three panelists. Um, but let me invite Justice Kiru now to provide his opening comments, which I'm sure will provide very valuable and useful context for the discussion that is to follow. Justice Kiru. Uh, thank you very much, Andrew, and good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure for me to uh, contribute to this summit. The AALA has come a long way since I launched it in 2013. I'm very impressed with uh, its achievements. All of its officers and members should be very proud. In my opinion, it is vital that associations such as the AALA are successful and have credibility because they are part of the solution to the problems of equal access to justice that this session will consider. <clears throat> Now, I have prepared a detailed paper that will be published after the summit on the AALA's website. So in the next 15 minutes, I will deal only briefly with some of the issues discussed in that paper. It is now generally accepted that whilst equal treatment of litigants may ensure equal access to justice in a monocultural or monocultural society, it will not do so in a multicultural society. There are numerous steps that should be undertaken as part of a holistic approach to overcome the obstacles that litigants from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds, coward backgrounds, face in attaining equal access to justice in Australian courts. Three obvious steps are, one, the availability of properly qualified interpreters and translators in the breadth of languages that are spoken in the community. Two, the provision of more comprehensive information and educational programs for CALD communities about the Australian judicial system. Three, the provision of better training to the legal profession about the particular challenges that our court system presents for CALD litigants. These steps are self-evident. They are discussed in my paper and I do not propose to make any further reference to them in the time available. The two steps that I do wish to focus on are the provision of training, information and tools for judges and the appointment of judges from diverse cultural backgrounds. It is obviously important that judges be provided with training, information and tools to enable them to recognise cultural dimensions to the giving of evidence by cal litigants and witnesses so that they can more accurately assess the evidence of such litigants and witnesses. This step involves a number of aspects, including the following. One, the provision of educational programs on culture specifically designed for judges. Two, the development of legal principles regarding the assessment of evidence given by CALD litigants and witnesses. Three, the inclusion in court bench books of guidelines dealing with cultural issues. Four, the reception of expert evidence on cultural issues either from an expert engaged by the parties or an expert appointed by the court. I will deal briefly with each of these four aspects. Judicial education programs on culture are necessary because a witness's cultural background can influence the content of his or her evidence as well as the manner in which it is given. Awareness of cultural dimensions to a witness's evidence can provide a judge with a perspective or context which assists the judge's understanding of the witness's evidence and the assessment of his or her honesty and reliability. Conversely, ignorance by a judge of such dimensions creates a risk that the judge may form an inaccurate impression of the witness's honesty and reliability, resulting in a miscarriage of justice. Educational programs for judges, for judges are provided by Australian judicial colleges and have been provided for some time. 
they have incorporated information about Australia's different cultures and how cultures can influence the content of a witness's evidence and how it is presented. Given the breadth of Australia's cultural diversity, it is impossible for those programs to educate judges on the culture of all parts of Australia's community. However, such programs need to be sufficiently detailed to give judges a sense of when a cultural dimension may be present so that they may consider what should be done about it. Australian courts have already accepted the following propositions regarding the assessment of oral evidence given by CALG litigants. First, cultural differences may affect the witness's demeanour and the way in which he or she gives evidence and therefore the court's assessment of those matters. For example, it is well recognised that communication in Aboriginal society may include the avoidance of direct eye contact as a sign of respect and a tendency to gratuitously concur with questions. In other cultures, it is impolite to directly respond to questions or there may be extreme discomfort involved in discussion of some topics, such as sexual topics, by women. Next, caution should be exercised when assessing the credibility of a witness who is from a cowled background. Next, in some cases, it will be inappropriate for a judge to place any reliance on the demeanour of a non-Anglo-Australian witness for the purposes of assessing his or her credibility. Next, in other cases, it will be appropriate for a judge to take into account the demeanour of a non-Anglo-Australian witness for the purposes of assessing his or her credibility, provided that the judge has regard to the difficulty, difficulties inherent in such an assessment. And finally, it is also possible to rely on a witness's culture to contextualise his or her evidence, particularly in circumstances where, but for that context, the evidence could be considered unreliable. In doing so, however, it is important to avoid stereotyping particular cultures. That is the extent to which Australian courts have laid down propositions regarding the assessment of oral evidence by cowled litigants. Compare that to the Supreme Court of New Zealand, which recently examined in the case that Andrew mentioned, the Den case, cultural issues bearing upon legal proceedings. It did so in a comprehensive way and laid down a number of propositions that I will summarise briefly. First, the social and cultural framework within which one or more of the parties operated may be of significance in a particular case. Next, judges should exercise caution in cases in which one or more of the parties have a cultural background which differs from that of the judge. Judges should develop a mental red flag alert system which gives them a sense of when a cultural dimension may be present so that they may actively consider what, if anything, should be done about it. Next, a key to dealing with such cases successfully is for the judge to recognise that some of the usual rules of thumb they use for assessing credibility may have no or limited utility. Next, most of the usual ways that judges assess credibility remain available. They include consistency of a narrative over time and with other evidence, particularly contemporaneous documents, and general plausibility. In many cases, managing a cultural dimension in evidence may require no more than the most basic of all tools in a judge's tool toolkit, namely context and common sense. Next, in some cases, it may be appropriate for a judge to receive social and cultural framework evidence. In such cases, it is open to witnesses to explain their own conduct by reference to their own social and cultural background and for parties to explain the way in which their relationship played out by reference to social and cultural framework that they operated under. The party's evidence can be supported by expert evidence under sections 128 and 129 of the New Zealand Evidence Act. Where litigants wish to introduce social and cultural framework evidence to explain the conduct of another party, that evidence is best provided either under sections 128 and 129 or by expert evidence under section 25. Next, judges need to take care to employ general evidence about social and cultural framework to assist in rather than replace 
a careful assessment of the case-specific evidence. Assuming without case-specific evidence that the parties have behaved in ways said to be characteristic of that ethnicity or culture is as inappropriate as assuming that they will be behaving in accordance with Western norms of behaviour. Next, people who share a particular ethnic or cultural background should not be treated as a homogenous group. The more generalised the evidence or information about the culture the court receives from a source other than the parties, and the less it is tied to the details of the particular case, the greater the risk of stereotyping. Next, appointment of an expert by the court pursuant to the court rules may, in some circumstances, be helpful in relation to cultural context. And finally, judges can usually leave it to the parties to put relevant information before the court. However, judges can inquire of the parties if they consider that they would be assisted by additional information as to social and cultural context. In many instances, such information will be able to be supplied by submission, relying on Section 129 of the Evidence Act of New Zealand. So as can be seen, the Supreme Court of New Zealand has provided comprehensive guidance on culture in court proceedings. I now return to the Australian position. Expert evidence on culture has not been a significant feature of legal proceedings in Australia. Anthropological expert evidence is commonly admitted under Section 79 of our Uniform Evidence Acts in native title claims brought by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. Evidence on culture practices is also admitted in family law proceedings. That is because culture is a relevant consideration in determining a child's best interests, particularly where the child is an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander. Less commonly, expert evidence relating to culture can be adduced where relevant to the subject matter of the proceeding, as in the case of the ACCC against Baroudi Art Proprietary Limited. That case concerned a successful claim by the ACCC alleging that the respondent wholesaler in that case had engaged in conduct likely to mislead or deceive potential purchasers by falsely implying that products had been hand painted by Australian Aboriginal persons and made in Australia. Evidence on, on Australian Indigenous art and culture was admitted in that case under Section 79 of the Uniform Evidence Acts. For evidence on culture to be admissible as expert evidence under Section 79 of the Uniform Evidence Acts, the person giving the evidence must have specialised knowledge based on the person's training, study or experience and his or her opinion must be wholly or substantially based on that knowledge. Whilst cultural matters have been referred to in some cases, such as immigration cases, I'm not aware of any instance where expert evidence on culture has been admitted specifically under Section 79 in a case that did not involve native title, Aboriginal culture or family law issues. For a court to take judicial notice of a cultural matter, under Section 144 of the Uniform Evidence Acts, it must not be reasonably open to question and either be common knowledge in the locality in which the proceeding is being held or generally, or capable of verification by reference to a document, the authority which cannot be reasonably questioned. Ordinarily, the impact of a particular culture on the conduct of demeanor of a litigant or witness in the proceeding would not come within section 144. The Uniform Evidence Acts contain only one reference to culture, namely the definition of improper question in section 41, subsection three. That definition, which is relevant to the court's duty in section 41, subsection one, to disallow an improper question, includes a question that, quote, has no basis other than a stereotype based on the witness's culture, end quote. In relation to bench books, there is an absence of uniformity among Australian jurisdictions. Bench books dealing with directions to juries regarding the assessment of the credibility and reliability of witnesses are very important. Unlike judges who may receive some cultural training it is almost certain that none of the randomly selected jurors will have received such training. 
Accordingly, it is highly likely that the judicial directions will be the only form of guidance that jurors will receive on cultural issues relevant to their crucial task. The final step that I will discuss is greater, greater cultural diversity in judicial appointments. This step is self-evidently desirable in order to ensure that the composition of the courts better reflects the diversity of the community they serve. Respect for the judiciary is likely to be enhanced if judges have similar backgrounds to litigants. That is because the public will have greater confidence that judges will perform their functions with a better understanding of the community they serve. However, complications can arise where a judge has the same cultural and linguistic background as one of the litigants appearing before him or her, but not the other litigant. One such potential complication can manifest itself where the party with the same cultural background as the judge gives evidence to an interpreter. In such a case, there is a risk that the judge may be influenced by his or her own understanding of the words uttered by the witness in his or her own language, rather than the words used by the interpreter, which will be the only words understood by the opposing party in the litigation. In such a case, there may be an inadvertent denial of procedural fairness because the judge will be influenced by a source of information which is not known to the opposing party. A similar problem could arise if the judge relies upon his or her own understanding of cultural mores applicable to one of the litigants without disclosing this to the parties and inviting submissions on it. Another potential complication is where the litigants belong to ethnic groups whose countries of origin are in conflict and the judge has the same background as one of those parties, one of those groups. One can imagine a situation where a judge has a Russian background and one of the litigants is Russian, whereas the other litigant is Ukrainian. In an obvious case such as this, the problem can be foreseen in advance and avoided by the judge not being allocated to hear that case. However, the potential problem may not be obvious in other cases. For example, when I was a trial judge, due to my Greek background, I was asked to recuse myself by a litigant who migrated to Australia what is now known as the Republic of North Macedonia. I refused to recuse myself on the basis that my ethnic background had no bearing on my ability to adjudicate upon the litigant's claim in that case against the public officers he was suing. Uh, that's probably all I've got time to cover. Obviously, we can come back to some of these issues in question time. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Justice Kiru. For those opening comments, they raise a number of really interesting questions that we can explore, at least in some detail during the panel discussion. And I'd like to turn um, to you, Justice Wood, uh, for the first question, if I may. Uh, I'm very interested in this concept of super diversity, which is really diversity within diversity. And Justice Kiru's remarks, I think, touched on some of the challenges in that regard. So you've, you've had lots of experience as a judge of the Supreme Court of Tesla. And you're also very involved with the Judicial Council on Cultural Diversity. Uh, what do you think are the major challenges that arise in, in this context, namely super diversity, and in particular, uh, access to justice for culturally and linguistically diverse litigants? Thank you very much, Andrew, and I'm delighted to be um, part of the panel session today. I'm sure I'm going to learn much more than I will impart. Um, there are major challenges indeed to ensure our justice system delivers equal, a uh, equal access to justice and to ensure trials are conducted fairly for all Australians. I think one of the challenges arises from our adversarial system. We are really, as judges, dependent on counsel to raise issues of cultural difference and barriers. Counsel's role is vital. So too is the role of solicitors in briefing Council about the needs of their clients. Now, the challenge here is for our courts to facilitate this role of counsel and to provide an opportunity for counsel to raise these issues away from the pressures of the, of the trial process and as early as possible. Entrenching this is one challenge. Another is that the envir environment needs to be collaborative. There may not be ready-made solutions, particularly in the super diversity space. A challenge for busy courts is setting time aside 
to work through the issues and measures tailored to the individual and their case. And an advantage will be the flexibility that that then offers to deal with intersectionality and multiple disadvantage. This really, of course, highlights the challenge of unrepresented, culturally diverse litigants. How can they be best informed about the court process to maximise their participation? Should there be a safety net access to a pro bono scheme in cases that warrant that? I'm just going to mention um, communication, the use of interpreters, partly so I can give a plug to the recommended national standards for working with interpreters in courts and tribunals. Access to justice must enable culturally diverse litigants to fully participate and be linguistically present in the proceedings. These standards are the work of the Judicial Council on Cultural Diversity and they achieve this ambitious goal. They provide comprehensive uniform standards for all courts and tribunals in Australia, the result of extensive collaboration, including with the interpreting profession. They've been endorsed at the highest level by the Council of Chief Justices. Part of the reason for their success, in my view, which has particular relevance to the area of super diversity, is the layering of responsibility. So each um, player in the process, the courts as institutions, judicial officers, lawyers and the interpreting profession are all, all shoulder responsibility. The challenge here that we all have is to actively ensure that these standards are used always in courts and tribunals. But a challenge too is one of resources and the geography of our country. I feel very strongly that our standard of justice should be the same in regional areas, the outback, as well as in our cities. Another challenge is uh, cultural diversity within our courts to promote a responsive and well-informed justice system. Important, of course, for ensuring public and litigant confidence. Here we think of naturally court staff and the judiciary, but integral to our criminal courts are the jury. There are many practical challenges to the inclusion of Aboriginal people. And as difficult as these challenges are, they need to be addressed. The ab absence of Aboriginal people and people, Torres Strait Islander people on juries involving Aboriginal accused must contribute to the palpable lack of trust and confidence in trial outcomes that we are seeing all too often. Of course, Aboriginal people are amongst our peers and should be represented on all juries. Another key advantage is to assist culturally diverse jurors who are unfamiliar with our legal systems. But in my experience, this education should be provided as a matter of course to all jurors rendering our justice system clear and explicit for everyone in our community. It is well accepted in Australia that education and programs about cultural awareness issues are invaluable for the judiciary. These programs inform about cultural difference and barriers to justice. They are offered in orientation programs for newly appointed judges and magistrates. They're also offered for the legal profession. One of the challenges here is to reach all lawyers, including those who feel they do not need education in cultural awareness. In other words, they do not know what they do not know. If lawyers entered the profession with a baseline of knowledge, education and awareness, that would provide a foundation for future learning and an understanding of its value. I highlight that the National Curriculum for Professional Legal Training Courses provides for the development of cultural awareness and skills. And this is an ideal stage for this learning to occur in the career of young lawyers and offered at this stage caps, captures both our future lawyers and our future judges. Judging human behaviour is inherent to the task of fact-finding. 
cultural awareness programs for the judiciary are vitally important to ensure that that task is carried out free of subconscious bias. These programs promote the need for pause, the need for reflection in our fact-finding task, and the need for an open mind to what we don't know and the possibility of difference or differences highly relevant to superdiversity. The importance of this awareness highlights a discrete challenge in criminal trials. A premise of our legal system is that juries are well equipped for the task of judging human behaviour, yet jurors necessarily assess conduct and responses through their own cultural lens. They may misread demeanour because of cultural difference. The accused or witness may belong to a race or culture with a negative image or stereotype in parts of the community. The intrusion of bias or assumption in the task of assessing credibility and judging human behaviour presents a risk of a miscarriage of justice, one that is not detectable and therefore cannot be corrected on appeal. Juries do not have access to cultural awareness programs. One of the challenges is how to guard against this risk. Justice Kiru has referred to trial judge directions. In meeting this challenge, counsel have a critical role in assisting the court. On a positive note, I have no doubt that a direction appealing to a jury's innate sense of fairness can be effective. I conclude with two observations. The first is that responsibility for these challenges lies with each of us as lawyers and judges. A layering of responsibility provides an effective safeguard. It also creates a conversation, and in that conversation, we have our best chance of getting it right. The second is the valuable learnings to be gained by sharing insights from other jurisdictions which share the same challenges. The 2019 called Landmark, Landmark Report and the Issues Paper are outstanding examples. Thank you. Thanks very much, Justice Wood. Uh, May, um, I'd like to ask you a question about evidence because there's a, there was a point that Justice Wood made and that is, we don't know what it is we don't know. And I guess inevitably that turns our focus on the benefits of expert evidence. And I was um, struck by something that Justice Kittery said, and that was that in Australia, uh, expert evidence on culture had not really been a significant feature in legal proceedings. This, I know, is an area in which you've spoken and written extensively, uh, particularly in relation to New Zealand. Could you tell us, please, why this is so important, access to expert evidence and knowing when to adduce expert evidence? And what forms do you think would be appropriate to facilitate access to expert evidence uh, for both litigants and uh, for the courts? Well, tēnā koutou katoa. I'm just, uh, well, I'm just uh, acknowledging you in the Indigenous language of the Māori people of New Zealand. Uh, of course, your question arises because uh, this is the problem that judges are having, and I feel very honoured to be speaking with two judges who have thought and written deeply in this area and have made a really important contribution from the coalface. Um, the problem is, as Justice Wood just uh, outlined, that lawyers aren't doing a good job. Um, they are not uh, providing judges in an adversarial system with the evidence that they need to be able to do their job. And this becomes very difficult because we have cases in New Zealand, in fact, there's a very funny one from Justice Tugud, who said, it is not my job to Google my way to a legal decision. It is your job, counsel, to provide me with the expert evidence that I need. And so the difficulty here is that I think lawyers have not been trained to uh, know their client well enough. Now, if we were in business, KYC is fundamental, know your client. But similarly, when we are representing our clients, we must always look to see what did they say? What did they do? Why did they do it? And, and, and then think about how that comes across in demeanour. That social and cultural framework that Justice Kiru has just summarised from Ding and Zing in our Supreme Court is fundamental. I, 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 I begged the Supreme Court in New Zealand. I said, look, 
even if it's not relevant in this case, we need guidance. Because the reason why the culturally and linguistically diverse parties in the court uh, report was written in 2019 was because, Justice Wood, of exactly what you said, which was that the parties turning up in courts at the coalface was simply transforming and the court was not able to keep up with it. And because it's an adversarial system and not an inquisitorial system, judges were struggling because they weren't being provided with the assistance. And of course, it is true that the pre-trial meetings, uh, conferences that are needed to make sure that all of the issues that might be relevant because of social and cultural framework might be relevant to determining who did what to whom and why, um, there's no doubt that doing that upstream will save an enormous amount of time downstream. Um, what my report captured was simply the number of problems if you just don't deal with the issue upstream. And Ding and Zim, which ended up in the Supreme Court, might have been one of those cases. Because actually, both parties were from mainland China. Both parties spoke almost, uh, that, that, that they did all their transactions in Mandarin. Uh, all the documents were in Mandarin. And yet, in determining whether or not uh, there was a partnership here, there was no mention of a social and cultural framework. There was no expert evidence adduced. Now, as Justice Kerry just summarised, what the Supreme Court said is, look, if you're deposing for your own party about what they thought and did socially and culturally, then that's fine. You don't need an expert. If you're deposing, if your client's deposing about what they did with the other party um, and from a social and cultural lens, then they don't need an expert. But if your party is now saying, well, that party over there did this and that's what it meant socially and culturally, then obviously you're going to need either one of three things, all right? Now, I say one of three things because we are talking about equal access to justice. And if you force too many people to have to get expert evidence when they don't need it, then that is expensive. And actually, it means that it's harder for them to get access to justice. But of course, the other two things are ju uh, judicial notice. And that is transforming. I quote from um, Justice Wood. I have now found her writings. I will quote them in future, Justice Wood. But she talks about the social transformation, that the social change we're going through. So do you know that um, Guanxi is now defined in the Oxford Dictionary? So what we what is now obvious, what we can now take judicial notice of, is transforming, is changing. And similarly, um, well-respected, reputable, um, published information is going to be more available. Um, I looked at Justice uh, Wood's writing. It replicates um, what's happening in New Zealand. Um, at the time she was publishing her extremely um, helpful article on cultural diversity, I was publishing the super diversity stock take. We're heading towards 30% super diversity, defined as 25% or more of the population not born in the country. In 2016, when Justice Wood was writing, you were at 26%. We are very similar, except that we have a larger number of uh, Indigenous peoples, 16% going to 20%. We have a huge amount of um, intermarriage, uh, which means that, frankly, um, by 2042, we're, you know, half our population is going to be Maori for such a current So uh, the, the, the result of all of this is simply the need for transformation. Uh, you know, uh, Justice Wood talked about a layering and a sharing of responsibility, and I just can't emphasise how important that is. Um, in our curriculum in the law school right now, they are, that there's a decision that's been taken to teach tikanga Māori in the course. Tikanga Māori means Māori customs and traditional values. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 you know, I'm going to be in court for almost the whole of 2024. All of the evidence is tikanga Māori because it's, for, it's a foreshore and seabed case. Well, actually, it happens to be two of them, two of eight. Um, and and if, I'm, if I'm not dead by the time I get to the eighth one, I'll tell you all about it. So, but, but the, the Zim and Ding was important because, as Justice Kerry said, in, in Australia, it's been native title, it's been Aboriginal matters and family law matters. So, Andrew, I also was very struck by that and took it down. But the, the, the thing in New Zealand is this, that um, this the report that I wrote emanated from Auckland. 
that was where the shoe was really pinching. Half the cases there were from Asian parties. And what we've discovered is that it's Asian parties, um, Asia, of course, being, you know, numerous 52 countries and, and billions of people, but mainly from mainland China. Mm-hmm. And uh, as Justice Wood said, representing themselves and not speaking English. And so you can just imagine the judges there thinking, what are we supposed to do? We, this is an adversarial process. It's not inquisitorial. How are we going to do our job? And so that is where all of this has come from. So, so it, it doesn't mean to say that we can't learn. We, uh, we, we will learn from all the learnings from the Indigenous peoples because that has been the spearhead for us as it has been the spearhead for you in terms of developing cultural expertise um, but the reality is that in New Zealand, it's it's spread because we just we we've now got one in three Asian in our biggest city. Well, i.e., the only city which qualifies as a city by OECD standards. We have the biggest Pacifica city in the world in Auckland, and then we have a, a, a very big growing Indigenous populations who, of course, are a disproportionate number of our young people uh, because because of their greater birth rate. And so it's an opportune time now simply for me to end by saying this, that the future topic, i.e. IQ, EQ, not enough for lawyers, not enough for judges, CQ, absolutely critical competence in the 21st century. And the Super Diversity Institute, which I set up, will be running a global culture in uh, cultural experts in courts conference in the Sorbonne together with a range of other people um, in, in this, on the 7th, the 6th and the 7th of April in 2023. This now becomes the big topic because if you need cultural experts, when do you need them? How do you use them? How do you maximise their use to help judges? Our Supreme Court said, well, actually, you can appoint some. In other words, if the, if the lawyers are hopeless and simply have left you to DIY, then actually you can reach out and get experts, but who do you get and how do you best use them? And and do do we make interpreters do it? Are are interpreters able to be a cultural bridge? Um, uh, There's there's a definition which has been used by one of the the organisations that's running this uh, conference in the Sorbonne. It, it, It defines cultural experts as the special knowledge which enables social legal scholars or cultural mediators or cultural brokers to locate and describe relevant facts in light of the particular background of the claimants and litigants and for the use of the courts. End. Sorry. Not at all, May. Some really interesting insights you've offered to us. And, of course, we could go on talking about this for the rest of the day, but time is running down. And um, I was wondering if I could be cheeky and just ask each of you to give your thoughts in 30 seconds uh, as to where do you think we need to focus our attention? The issues paper, as you know, May, identifies a number of areas and initiatives in which we could help to take the uh, the process forward. That includes um, research, judges and the courts, interpreters and translators, lawyers, professional education, engagement, policy formulation, and also, of course, um, an issue that's close to my heart, incorporating Indigenous law and culture into the law school curriculum. So uh, perhaps, uh, Justice Kiro, I could turn to you first for your 30-second soundbite on where you think we should be focusing our attention at this point in order to move the process forward. Uh, Two comments, Andrew. Firstly, uh, in Australia, we will need to amend our Evidence Act if we are to receive uh, cultural evidence. At the moment, the uh, uh, requirements for the receipt of such evidence uh, are too restrictive compared to New Zealand. But directly addressing your question, I think um, no one measure is sufficient in its own. Uh, We need a a holistic approach. And I think key to that is education. Uh, Education of not just judges and the legal profession, but also members of the CALD communities themselves, so that they have a better understanding of our judicial system, our legal system, so that they don't have unrealistic expectations and don't get unnecessarily disappointed in the process. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Justice Kiru. Justice Wood, uh, your thoughts in terms of where we should be focusing our attention and how we might move the process forward? 
Sure. Well, I think awareness is everything. From awareness comes everything else. Um, I, I have been fascinated by um, Justice Kiru's paper and I think guidance in the use of expert um, social and cultural evidence um, would be wonderful. Um, and, of course, the consideration that's been given to that by May. And um, in terms of first steps, I think a stop take on all the work that's been done so we're not doubling up and we've got a sense of pathways and institutions we can engage with and so there are my thoughts. Thanks very much Justice Wood. May I could uh, suggest one initiative and that is to get you across the Tasman to visit us here in Australia as soon as possible so we can um, develop some momentum and, uh, and, and draw you into the discussion over here. Um, but uh, very briefly, what do you think are some of the key areas in terms of priority and what we should be focusing on really at the, at the here and now? I think we should springboard off what the Supreme Court in New Zealand has done. What they have done is they have adopted a social and cultural framework around the Evidence Act. And they have said that uh, judges and lawyers should consider if there is a social and cultural framework on adjudicative facts, that is relevant in the case. And that, so if someone was to say to me now, well, May, how do I start? I simply will say this to them. Put a social and cultural framework around the case, your client, the issues, the evidence, and tell me what you see. Sure. Well, I think our time has come to an end, I'm afraid to say. And that uh, really just leaves me to thank all of you very much for your contribution and your insights uh, to Justice Kiru uh, for the keynote address um, and to all, all of our panellists, uh, Justice Wood and May, for contributing to the discussion this afternoon. I hope everyone has found it as enjoyable and insightful as I have, and I look forward to being part of the process as we move things forward. Thanks for the uh, opportunity. Thanks to the Australian Asian Australian Lawyers Association for the summit. Um, and let me wish everyone a happy afternoon and uh, uh, best wishes for the rest of the summit. Thank you.